So we're talking at lunchtime about um, God's sovereignty and how he works that out and how that uh, is manifest and uh, this whole question of uh, free will and things. If you turn to Genesis chapter 17, I'm sorry, I said Genesis but was meant Revelation. The other end of the Bible. Revelation 17, sorry. And about verse 15. <coughs> Get an insight here on how sovereignty works and the will of man fits into that. He said, and he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked. And will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So what's going on here in this context is that uh, the Antichrist and his uh, forces are turning on the woman, the harlot, Babylon, which I take to be the literal city of Babylon here. But the, uh, they're turning on uh, Babylon here and they think it's their plan. Where in actuality, it's God's plan that they're executing. They just don't know it. But they're making free will choice here. And their free will choice is what God intends them to do. So I think that's an interesting, interesting insight into how that uh, gets worked out. So now we're going to move on in our series here. Work hard to get, you, get us out of here by three or four. Um, we're going to look at the New Covenant now. Uh, third. Uh, are the fourth of uh, the four covenants that we're going to look at in the New Te Old Testament, and we're going to trace these into the New. The um, what we've seen is God has narrowed what He's doing, this promise of seed and king to a particular royal line of David. So we see God progressively narrowing down what He's going to do. He's uh, reiterated His promise to make Israel a nation and give them a land. So again, in the Davidic covenant, we see king and kingdom and land all together, right? All uh, connected inseparably. He's promised an eternal royal house, a kingdom and a king. And these references uh, to the seed and the great name and so forth clearly link this covenant back to the Abrahamic covenant Link, links it back to the uh, land covenant as well. So these things are all inextricably linked. They're all together. And they form, again, this framework through which we can look at the Bible, right? That pulls all the revelation together. So we're going to move now from the land and the seed, and we're going to look at this blessing covenant that was part of the original Abrahamic covenant. And he's going to Cult, uh, develop that in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 37. So if you could turn in your Bibles there, we're going to look at those verses pretty quick, closely. When we get there. So here's our chart again. And again, up toward the top here, let's see. Right, you know, right along the top, you, you have the timeline. Then you have these books that end-to-end -end cover the whole timeline of the, New, of the Old Testament. So this is kind of the chronological books that link together the whole thing. And we've been showing how those uh, covenants, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis uh, 12, and then the land covenant in Deuteronomy 30, and then the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7 are happening along that timeline. And again, as I was saying, you can see where these other books kind of line up with regard to these covenants, where they fit in, uh, prophetic books and things like that. So these things, again, you've got this main thrust of uh, historical narrative. You've got these covenants that tie it all together. And then the other books of the Bible you can look at as kind of commentary on those things that are happening commentary on what God's doing, an elaboration or an explanation about what he's either happened or going to happen. 
So the new covenant now is even later, you know, happening in this period of Jeremiah uh, during this uh, end of um, um, Second Kings. So again, in the Abrahamic covenant, best I can figure, about 2082 B.C. And then the land covenant, about 1400, so there's 682 years there. And then the Davidic covenant, about 1005. So there it gives us another 395 years or a total, I'm sorry. And then now the new covenant in 587 B.C. So again, this is just moving down uh, the corridor of history here. Another 400 years. Right, so a long time between these covenants, a long time between these elaborations. God is, uh, again, progressively revealing what he's going to do over time. Long time. We're looking at about 1,500 years from the Abrahamic covenant to the new covenant. So don't lose that uh, perspective that this is uh, God unfolding his plan. And we stand, again, as I was saying before the break, uh, at the uh, culmination of all this. You know, we can look back on this. Uh, Abraham, David, Jeremiah, they couldn't see the whole picture like we can. So it's pretty amazing in my mind that we have this privileged position of seeing this whole drama that's unfolding and God's explaining to us what he's doing. Gives you an idea of the patience of God. Oh, absolutely. Lots and lots of patience. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that his sovereignty is being worked out in history, you know, in history. It's actually happening. So let's take, before we dig into the new covenant here, let's take a look at uh, kind of the context, the big picture. Um, Jeremiah has been named uh, kind of Judah's last chance, right? He's pleading with Judah to turn from their wicked ways, southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin here. So it calls, starts out with Judah's call, first in chapter 1, and then prophecies about Judah, and then prophecies about the nations, and then finally the fall of Jerusalem. So this is one of those interesting places where God uses the nations around them to bring chastisement, and then turns around and chastises the nations that chastise them right, for overdoing it. So section we're going to look at, it falls right into this area of prophecies concerning Judah. So we're going to be looking at Jeremiah 31. In that section, uh, we see um, condemnation and then conflicts or the opposition to Jeremiah himself. And then this uh, section that's called the Book of Consolation, where Israel is being, in light of what's coming, Israel is given a reason to hope things are going to get better after this. Think that you have a better future even though you're about to be severely chastised, taken into captivity and uh, away from the land. And then finally, uh, the collapse of Jerusalem, chapters 34 to 45. So again, our, our passage, what we're going to be looking at is in the middle of this uh, section, excuse me, on consolation. So God is consoling his people that he is about to go into um, um, exile, which um, is kind of a sobering thought in some ways that uh, he's within the nation. Uh, there are faithful people, uh, but they're going into exile too. Right? So there, as the nation, as the king goes, so goes the nation and the whole nation goes. So in this area of consolation, then, we're going to look specifically at this future restoration of Jerusalem. So this is the uh, kind of the center part of this consolation is that even though they're being exiled, even though they're about to witness the most gruesome destruction of God's holy city, the city, this is not the end of the story. Does God's promises continue? Yes, they continue. Does the land promise continue? Yes, it's going to continue. Does the promise of a king continue? Yes, it's going to continue. That's what this answers here, this section. So where we're at in this section is the restoration of the nation. Right, That Jerusalem is going to be 
kind of an exemplar of how the nation is going to be restored. The book of Jeremiah, especially the section we're in here, is consistently future-looking. So when you go through there, you see these repeated phrases, the days are coming, uh, that day, those days, latter days. These are all ways that uh, Jeremiah, particularly, but the other prophets use to talk about those end times, the time that before, just before Messiah comes, the time before Jesus returns. Again, their horizon is they're looking forward to this restoration of Israel, this establishment of Israel in the land, this king and this kingdom of their Messiah. That's what they're looking for. To them, that is the end of history. That's the latter days. That's the end times. That's the end of history they're anticipating. Again, we have a little bit more revelation, so we know about the eternal state that follows them, but they didn't know that. So this is what they're looking for. It says, behold, you know, days are coming. They're looking forward again to this messianic age. This age when the Davidic kingdom is going to be set up and established. That's their horizon. Now we've seen that these other covenants now have been confirmed. That uh, um, we're not adding uh, a new covenant that's replacing the others. Just like the Mosaic Covenant didn't replace the Abrahamic Covenant, so the New Covenant doesn't replace the Abrahamic, the Land, and the Davidic Covenant. It's an additional covenant. An additional covenant that is unconditional, as we'll see as we go through here. So it continues. These promises of land, seed, and blessing continue. And in that chain of revelation, uh, this New Covenant in Jeremiah elaborates this promise that they need to uh, have a new heart, a new blessing to take the land. So as we saw in Deuteronomy, to possess the land, they have to obey the law. That's the, that's the situation that's being set up uh, in order to uh, be blessed in the land, in order to be uh, in the land for a long time, in order to live the land, live in the land. They have to obey the uh, Mosaic Law, and Jeremiah reminds us that they did not do that, right? He presents that throughout the book, that they failed to do that, so they failed to go into the land. They failed to possess it. They're being ejected for their failure, ejected for their uh, spiritual adultery. So the question arises then, if they're kicked out, if they are so disobedient that they can't take the land, how in the world will they ever possess it? How is this going to happen if they won't obey the law? It seems to be like an insurmountable problem here. The New Covenant answers that question. So we see, uh, just to divide it up here in some big pictures, big pieces, we see this promise that's made to Jeremiah, or this promise that God makes in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 32. We see the provisions of that promise, and then we see the permanence of the promise in 35 to 37. So that's, we're going to walk through that. So let's just read through that, Jeremiah 31, and we'll pick it up at 31. It said, but don't, behold, days are coming, Jeremiah 31, 31. Again, setting this up, projecting this into the latter days. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant, covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So he's not talking about a new covenant that replaces the Abrahamic covenant, is he? My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be my God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. 
from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the host, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being will also cease from being a nation before me forever. For thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. So this is the let's dig into this here in these areas. So in 31 through 32, he starts with this, Behold, days are coming, at the beginning of verse 31. So he's uh, obviously putting this into the context of some future age, right? That this is future that's coming. And the covenant is between who here? The house of uh, Israel in the north, who's been in captivity already, and the uh, tribe of Judah, the southern tribe. So this is specifically who the New Covenant is made for, uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Right? It's the New Covenant in contrast with the Mosaic Covenant. So he's saying the covenant I made with your fathers, whoops, is this the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? No, the next clause clarifies that. It's not the, not the fathers, but in the day that I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, right? So this is the Mosaic Covenant. So we see right away in Jeremiah 31, 31, that the Mosaic Covenant had a shelf life, right? It was going to be replaced at some point. It wasn't going to last forever. Pharisees missed that, right? Jesus came and fulfilled the Mosaic Covenant, brought it to a close, but the Pharisees missed it. They were committed to obeying the Mosaic Covenant. Remember that they had, uh, sometimes it's characterized as setting up a fence around the law of Moses so you won't even get close to breaking it. Why, why do you think they were so concerned about breaking the Mosaic Covenant? Because um, that's what ultimately brought them into exile. And yeah, yeah. They were. Uh, they knew that breaking the Mosaic Covenant had brought them into exile. So they were wanting to get Israel back in the land. That was what their dream was. That was their intent. They wanted to have everybody obey the Mosaic Law so that they could go back into the land. And you know, even during Jesus' ministry, there was this sense among the Israelites, this is what's called the Second Temple Judaism. There is even a sense among the Jews that are alive of that, of that day that they continued to be dispersed. So why do I say that? Uh, remember when Jesus was talking about that he was going to go away and where I'm going, you can't come. Remember that in the Gospel of John? And people heard him say that. And what did they respond to? When Je How did they respond when Jesus said that? They looked at him and he said, Is he going to go among the Jews of the diaspora? Is he going to go among the Jews that are scattered? So there was this sense that they weren't fully back in the land yet, even during Jesus' time. Yes, there were some Jews there, but they were under Roman occupation. Right. So the Pharisees... Uh, as harsh as Jesus is with them, uh, I have to admit sometimes I have uh, some sympathy for them because they were reading the Old Testament that we're reading. And they were reading the Old Testament that said, okay, in order to be in the land, we have to obey the law. So I'm, I'm going to work really hard in obeying the law, and I'm going to make everybody else work hard too because we've got to get back in this land. Right? That's the, that was kind of the background, the motivation of what they were doing here. So this new covenant that God is promising is after the Mosaic Law. They missed this part, right? That the Mosaic Law itself had a shelf life. 
And, you know, there's this paternal language in here about, look what I'm going to do. Um, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, right? And the day I took them by the hand. So very kind of a tender sort of paternal language describing what's going on here is that God was not coming down on them with just a rule book. He was taking care of them. Remember that phrase, pedagogos, from the book of Galatians, that, they, that it was provided as a guide, a uh, protection, a protector for God's people and God's nation. So it's very kind of a paternalistic, a father helping his children sort of language that's going on here that God's using. So um, I think I left my footer in there from the previous slide. <laughs> So the Mosaic Law, had, again, had this shelf life. It was going to come to an end at some point. That's what John, John 1, 17 says, grace and truth. You know, law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not um, putting those things in conflict. It's saying first there was one, then another. That it came to an end. It finished. So we see this... Um, constant in the history of Israel, this constant uh, uh, renewal by God and violation by Israel of the new covenant or them rededicating themselves to the, uh, not to the new covenant, to the uh, Mosaic law and this constant rededication of themselves to try to do better again. So during the time of Moses, I mean, early on, they're, they're worshiping a golden calf. Right? They've created a, an idol. Uh, I don't know if they thought that was the image of the living God, and they created an idol to worship that, or if they made up another God altogether. But early on, they're, they're uh, rebelling against the law with the golden calf. So in Joshua 23 and 24, you see them uh, uh, about to go to war uh, over separation there. And then Joshua, again, calls them back together. They rededicate themselves to what's happening. 1 Samuel 12, uh, they, um, is this uh, renewal of the covenant, uh, rededication of themselves to the covenant. And in 1 Samuel 10, after a violation, they had fallen away. So over and over they do this. And Hezekiah... Josiah, we see Josiah becoming rededicated, uh, bringing Israel back, discovering the Book of the Covenant, uh, causing this kind of spiritual revival, and then the next kings immediately uh, go back to violating the law. So what we see in the New Covenant then is Israel has proven over and over again the, uh, they're idolaters, they're idol worshipers, they can't keep the law, so what we're going to find in the new, to, new Covenant here is God is going to do for them what they can't do for themselves. Another act of grace here. God's going to intervene because God is going to bring about what he plans to do. One quote here is, Human history since the Garden of Eden has been the story of humankind's flight for God and his pursuit of us. So in other words, God's taking the initiative all the time. The God who speaks in these verses, commenting on this, is, is a pursuing God. He refuses to leave his people alone to follow their own self-destructive paths. So again, what I, we were, keep coming back to is, is that uh, there's only a couple places you can be before God, right? You can be in that place of blessing or you can be in that place of chastisement. He is not letting us go. You know, we can resist him the whole way and be chastised or we can, we can submit. We can do that. They, they needed help. We have the Holy Spirit. So in 33 and 34, we see these provisions of what God's going to do. Let's read that. He says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. What's he going to do here? I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
They will not teach again each man his neighbor or each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquities and their sin, and I will remember, which I will remember no more. So what's God doing here? He's going to put their, his law inside them, in their heart. He's going to change their desire, in other words. He's going to give them this internal renewal for his people. This is going to happen. God's going to do it. He's the one who's got the uh, pen that's going to write on their hearts to renew them. He's going to write his law not on a tablet of stone, but on their hearts. And they will all know him. He'll be their, his, he'll be their God in the truest sense of the term. Not objectively only, but subjectively. He will be their God. They will embrace Him. They will draw themselves to Him and know Him. And again, the word here, yada, is to uh, know intimately. As a man knows his wife, they'll, we'll know, they'll know God. They'll draw cl that close to Him. That's the idea here. And God is going to cause this change to happen within them. He's going to, he's going to make this change in them. So you see this kind of this emerging, this beautiful picture that God has established this Mosaic law as the condition for them to possess the land. And God's not even going to allow uh, the disobedience of the Mosaic law to stand in the way of that. He's going to give them a heart to obey that law and go into the land. He's doing it all. He's doing the whole thing. He's going to forgive their iniquity and their sin. He'll remember it no more. And when he uh, uses language like that, that he's not going to uh, not merely remember, not merely have it in his mind, but he's not going to act on their sin. He's not going to punish them for their sin. He's going to forgive them. He's going to make provision that their sin would be forgiven. They would be cast away from them, that they wouldn't pay the penalty for the sin. That's what he's, not just that God's going to selectively suffer Alzheimer's or something and have a memory lapse, but he's going to not act on the sin that they've committed. Or he's going to act on it in a way that's going to spare them, maybe is a better way to put it. So again, he has staked his reputation on it. Look at verses 34 and 35 here says that, uh, I'm sorry, 35 and following, thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light uh, by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord, Lord of hosts is his name. Is that, what's he referring to there? Talked about it yesterday. Creation. Creation. Remember, God is sovereign. Why? He owns it all. Yeah, he created everything. That's what Jeremiah is hearkening back to. Here's the God who created everything, so he is sovereign over everything he does, including the renewal and restoration of the nation. God can do this because God is sovereign. That's what Jeremiah is saying here. If he's not, if Jeremiah is wrong and God can't do this, then he must be wrong about creation. He must be wrong about the fact that God owns everything. He's staking his, his um, reputation on restoring and renewing this nation to its land. The Lord of hosts is uh, um, basically the God of the armies. Yahweh of the hosts here is Yahweh of the armies. He's again, he's, so, he's exerting not only his cosmic uh, sovereignty over everything that's been created, but his ability to coerce the nations as a lord of the armies. Remember again from Je uh, Acts 17, Paul says that he lifts up nations and tears them down, determines where their borders are going to be and for how long. Because he has the uh, sovereignty, the authority, the power to do that. He's the God of the armies. He's controlling all this. So again, he stakes his sovereignty 
on the survival of this nation. He says in verse 36, if this fixed order departs, the fixed order of the universe, if this fixed order departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease. So last I looked, the sun and the moon were still rising and setting. The stars were still in their course. Though we have a stray comet or something come, up by, come by every once in a while. But they're still in place. The tides still come in and out. So as long as that continues, that is, as long as the creation continues, Israel will be a nation before God. He's staking, his, he's staking his reputation on the survival of this nation. If the nation doesn't survive, if the nation is not restored, if the nation is not put in the land, then God is not a God worth worshiping. He's fooled us, whoever this is. But he is sovereign. That's what he's saying here. So the nation may be decimated, as Jeremiah is predicting, but it's not going to be eliminated, right? It's going to survive. Again, this is the word of comfort that Jeremiah is bringing to the nation and the revelation to us of what God is still working out his plan, that God is at work, that he is reinforcing the promise he made to Abraham and passed along to Isaac and Jacob. He is reinforcing and reiterating the promise that he made in the land covenant to restore them to their land. That they're going to have a king there. They're going to reign and rule in Jerusalem because that's the place where the king is. So all these things come together and work together and um, we are mutually reinforcing. So in verses 35 and 36, uh, we see this reiteration or summary of what God has said here. Uh, if this fixed, if the sun and moon depart. Um, so no matter what evil Israel might perpetrate, or how long they might wander from their faithful husband, he's going, and how far they're scattered, he is going to draw them back together. And his choice of that nation made back in Genesis 12 where he made told Abraham that I will make you a great nation. His choice, his election of that nation cannot be undone. He has committed himself. He is not going to give up. This is going to be relentless. So, again, as we review here, he's talked about a future age, that this is a, this is a uh, prophecy for a future age. It brings the Mosaic Covenant to an end. Don't lose that. That's why it's the New Covenant. It doesn't replace the Abrahamic Covenant. It replaces the Mosaic Covenant. It's between God and the nation of Israel. And it internalizes God's law and fellowship with God and it ensures them that they're going to have this direct and intimate and personal relationship, this personal interaction with God. Guarantees that. And these are things God's going to do, right? He's going to cause this to happen in them. We've gone through the Old Testament at this point. We've traced the Abrahamic covenant and then the land, Davidic, and new covenants, tied them all together, showed how that's coming out over time and over history to pull the Bible together. Now we're going to look at what happens after the New Testament, but it's before the uh, what happens after the Old Testament, before the New Testament. What was the expectation? What were the prophets expecting for the future? What was the hope of Israel between Malachi and Matthew? What were they expecting? And then um, we'll carry that into the New Testament, show how that expectation continues. So again, our purpose here, we want to glorify God. We want to see what he's doing in history. So we can glorify him more and more. So we're going to look at a couple of the prophets first to see what they were expecting. And then we're going to look at some what's called a big seminary word, intertestamental literature. Fascinating area. We'll get to that in a minute here. 
So what's going on between the Testaments here? Is we're going to look at this new covenants. We've seen this as for a future age. We just went over all this. So here are the biblical covenants. So we had a little interaction before about the difference between biblical and theological covenants, right? The biblical covenants are derived from Scripture, as we've been doing. Uh, the theological covenants are kind of a theological construct we place on Scripture. So if you're familiar with uh, uh, the language, uh, one's inductively derived. That is, the biblical covenants are taken inductively from the Scriptures. The theological covenants are deductively applied. So one's inductively derived, the other's inductively applied. Right? So things like the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, they don't actually appear in Scripture, but theologians have looked at that and categorized things. These are the biblical covenants. Uh, some people would disagree with some of them, uh, Edenic and Adamic covenants and things like that. But we've talked about the Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, the land, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. We've talked about these. These are all uh, biblical covenants that we can go to the Bible, uh, study them, understand what they're talking about. And then the ones we've looked at um, more closely, the Abrahamic covenant was all about possession of the land. Right? From our perspective here, as we look at the land promises. The land covenant was all about the regathering in the land. The Davidic covenant was all about the reestablishment of this king and rule of God over the land. And then this new covenant is about the regeneration of Israel so they can go into the land. Right? This is the um, thing we're looking at. What we'll unpack here in this next series of um, sections here is that you can see that there's um, New Testament evidence that these things continue. So we'll talk about that as we go through too. But it's, this is the big picture on all the covenants and the ones we've looked at more closely. So again, we're just to reiterate the chronology here. This revelation has happened over a long period of time. So it hasn't happened all at once, uh, but it's happened over, over a period. And then what we're going to look at, we're going to look very quickly at Isaiah and see what Isaiah has to say. So again... These other books, I'm, I don't mean to diminish them at all, but in the context of biblical revelation, uh, they could be understood, I think largely should be understood, as commentary about how this Davidic Abrahamic covenant is being elaborated and carried out over time. They're commenting on that. They're describing it. They're saying this is God's work and his deeds and what he's doing or what he will do in order to bring all this about. So we'll look at uh, Isaiah, who was before the exile, and then Ezekiel, who was during the exile, be our examples today. So Isaiah predicted this return from a worldwide exile. Sound familiar? Right. We saw this in the land covenant, right? Not a local exile to Babylon or um, Assyria, but a worldwide exile. So he predicted this uh, this uh, second and what he and I think a final regathering. It's the only one that's talked about in Isaiah 11, 11 and 12. So it says then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the with the second time, the second time with His hand the remnant of His people, and assemble all the banished ones of Israel, and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So again Isaiah. Uh, is looking forward to a uh, time when there's a worldwide dispersion. I don't think Isaiah is talking about the dispersion to Assyria and Babylon here. He's talking about a worldwide regathering. And it's the second time that God has done that. So it's not the subject of this uh, lecture, but um, if you look at the We'll just do a bunny trail here for a second. If you look at the uh, history of Israel right now, that uh, from about uh, 70 AD and continuing, uh, they were dispersed all over the world. 
They were out of the land. Every nation they went to, they were persecuted. Until May of 1947, when God reestablished Israel as a nation on the earth through a providential series, a long series of events, uh, reestablished Israel on the earth. And at the time that he reestablished Israel, uh, less than, um, my memory is serving me correctly right now, uh, less than uh, 11 or 12 percent of all the Jews in the world at that time were in Israel when that nation was formed. Anybody know what the um, percentage of Jews, worldwide Jews, are in Israel today? 50%? Almost 50. And in God's providence, the increase of anti-Semitism around the world, including in the United States, is accelerating the rate of return, Aliyah, to Israel. So not only are more than half the Jews in the world, or close to half the Jews in the world in Israel now, but the rate of migration back to Israel is accelerating. Not only that... Mm -hmm. So if the other 50% actually get into Israel, are there, is there room for them, or are they, just, are they going to have to expand their borders in order to make room for mm -hmm. all these people? They're not occupying the land God gave them yet. Right. Yeah. We'll talk when we come back to that. Okay. Uh, so their, their uh, return is accelerating right now. And on top of their accelerating return, uh, the birth rate among Jews living in Israel is higher than uh, Jews living outside Israel. So not only are Jews that are alive right now returning faster and faster, but uh, once they're in the land, they're reproducing faster. So a, even a higher percentage of Jews in the world are in the land. Now, I don't think that the, um, um, I think the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that he will return them a second time is fulfilled yet. I think that'll happen. The Jews are going to be back in the land before the tribulation begins. But I think what we're witnessing is the beginning of that. The beginning of regathering those Jews into their land that God talked about in the land covenant. Remember I said it was going to take a process. It was going to be a period of time. So they're going to be back in the land when the tribulation begins. Right? They're, going to, they're going to be there already. So it might be crowded, but over the period of time that's covered in the tribulation, God is going to sort out believers from unbelievers among the Jews. And that would be a different class. Okay. <laughs> so but that, I think that's what we're witnessing today. Right? That they're they're being regathered. This is the beginning of the second and final regathering of Israel into the land in preparation for Jesus' coming, ultimately. So this was uh, predicted. We talked about this in the land covenant. It seemed like it was predicting a two-phase return. First phase would be unbelief. And then God would restore them, right? And then he elaborates on what that means in the New Covenant. So he expands that promise to restore them spiritually. First he's going to restore them physically to the land. Then he's going to restore them spiritually. He, he elaborates on that in the New Covenant. What's that going to look like? And he talks about that in Ezekiel. I will bring you off from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. Again, remember that the, uh, what's driving Jewish Aliyah right now is largely persecution of the Jews. Uh, he's driving them with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. So there's this two-phase thing going on here, right? He's gathering them into the land first. And then he's bringing, he's sorting them out. He's going to enter into judgment with them. Two phases here. So the first, they're going to be gathered in unbelief and judgment. I think that's what's, what's happening now, that we're seeing the beginnings of that. And then they will receive the covenant. 
I will make you pass under the rod, he says in Ezekiel 20. I will not bring you into the I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge from you the rebels, and they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So I think this is what Ezekiel is talking about. He's talking about this new covenant being applied to them. That he's going to bring them into the land, he's going to judge them, and then he's going to bring them into the bond of the covenant, the new covenant. He's going to reestablish them. So this is the expectation that Ezekiel is looking for. So he's looking for them to be regathered in 21 through 28, restored to the land, regenerated. Verse 24, David's going to be their king, their shepherd. They're going to be empowered to walk and observe the law. Again, this is all consistent with what God has promised in the covenants. Ezekiel is seeing this happening. They're going to occupy the land. David's going to shepherd them. The new covenant's made, and God's tabernacle will be to them, and the nations will know that Israel is God's people. This is the fulfillment of everything that these covenants have been promising. All that they anticipate. That's what Ezekiel is looking for. That's what Isaiah was looking for. And they're writing in this 593 to 570 period. Right there, Ezekiel particularly is is after, after the land, after they've been kicked out of the land. They're not even there anymore. Jerusalem's been destroyed. And God's given this prophecy about what's going to happen in the future. And that prophecy is all centered in how he's going to maintain and fulfill the promises that he's made. He's encouraging them. It's the insurance. It, you know, again, this is all tied back to the Abrahamic and land and Davidic and new covenants. And they'll be literally regathered there. And I think, as, as I said, in my opinion, uh, we're witnessing that now, the beginnings of it, in preparation for the coming tribulation. So both uh, the covenants, the prophets, history, as I said, if you look at history through the lens of the covenants, what God has said seems to all line up to suggest that, in fact, God is going to do what he said he's going to do over a period of about 1,500 years. He is not backing off. So if we summarize the prophets just generally, what we see is like five features here. Uh, we see consistently in the prophets this promise that God who scattered the Jews will also regather them. That they're going to be restored. We see this consistently in the prophets. That God's going to bring them back. And again, it's very consistent with the covenants, is my point here. Is that all this holds together. All the, all the prophecies, the wisdom literature. Uh, going through right now a series on the Psalm of Ascents. Which are uh, Psalms, uh, what is it, 120 to 134. They just drip with promises associated with the Abrahamic land, Davidic, and New Covenants. All the literature of the Bible just is reflecting all these promises that God has made. Reiterating, reinforcing, reminding, letting them know, I haven't forgotten about this. So they say the Davidic king is going to come and rule and protect the nation. As I said, the whole Old Testament anticipation was for the restoration and the, the establishment, the restoration to the land and the establishment of God's king and kingdom. That he is going to rule and reign the world, not just Israel, but the world from Israel. God's going to dwell among the people and they're going to be his people in a unique way. And I think that's, again, a reflection and echo throughout the Bible of the New Covenant. That they're going to be God's people. That he's going to, they're going to have their internalized, internalized law written on their hearts. Isn't it interesting when Jesus comes and he gives the Sermon on the Mount, that the way he presents the law is an inter internalized law. Not keeping the law like the Pharisees which was all external. But Jesus says, you know, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you violated the law. It's a different kind of law. It's an internal law. 
that blessings are going to flow to the nations. And we're going to see this more clearly in the New Testament, but that blessings are going to flow to the nation through the people in the land of Israel. I mean, after all, they were set apart to be a nation of priests. What do priests do? Who are, who are priests an intermediary for? Yeah, they represent the man to God. Yeah, they're intermediary between Israel and God and man and God. They're a kingdom of priests, right? That they're all going to know him. Isaiah, I think, 2. Let's turn there for a second, just as an example. Well, I'm not embarrassing myself by taking to the wrong verse. But Isaiah 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Looking forward to this uh, rest, time of restoration. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah, Judah and Jerusalem, now will come about in the last days. So uh, Isaiah sets the context here, the time period he's talking about in the last days. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. And I think this is a actual literal physical change in topography is going on here. And will be raised up above the hills, and the nations will stream to it. So all the nations are going to be drawn to the house of the Lord. And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations. Notice that. Even when Jesus comes back, even when he's established on the earth, nations continue to exist. Right? He will judge between the nations and he will render decisions for many people. And so on. But the knowledge of the Lord will be widespread. So is that how like verse 34 of the New Covenant comes I think, about? I think so. I think that Jerusalem is going to be, uh, Israel is going to be involved with this. Letting people know who God is. So I think they're going to have a role to play. And then God will recognize and exalt in Israel and among the nations, again, as it says here in Isaiah 2, that God is going to be exalted. The nations are coming. They're going to stream to Him. You can correlate this with Zechariah chapter 14. You can do that on your own. But the uh, Zechariah chapter 14 talks about the establishment of... Uh, God's kingdom on the earth and the nation streaming to it under a penalty if they don't. So now we're going to talk about between the Testaments. So what I'm establishing here is that these, uh, this chain of revelation that happened over a period of about 1,500 years was reinforced in the prophets. And if you study the prophets even more closely, I just show you two examples. If you study the prophets even more closely, you'll see these echoes of the covenants throughout, anticipation that the covenants were going to be literally fulfilled. And now we're going to look at stuff happens between the Testaments. So between Malachi and Matthew, you've got a, a group of literature. It's really fascinating reading if you uh, want to, wouldn't substitute this for Bible reading, but if you have the time and the inclination, it's worth reading. The Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, if for nothing else, it's cool to say those words around your friends because they think you're really smart. So, so why bother with this stuff? Why look at these? Well, keep in mind, uh, they're not biblical writing. Okay, so these are not inspired in the same way that biblical texts are. These are not inspired texts. Um, they're devotional, some of them are devotional reading. Others are just uh, history of Israel that's been written. Uh, they're wisdom writings. Uh, this is a good way to live, right? Because there's a Messiah coming. You can see their expectation and their understanding, their reading of the New Testament or the Old Testament. You can see how their understanding get in between the Testaments. And this is, uh, again, uh, covering a period of about uh, between roughly 200 BC and 200 AD. So this is overlapping the end of the Old Testament, the beginning of the New Testament. This is kind of the world that Jesus walked into. 
that's really what the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, and Dead Sea Scrolls are describing, is the expectation that Jesus was walking into when he was born. What were people thinking? What were they expecting? So the Apocrypha, they are, uh, most of them are pretty short, uh, written between about 330 and 63 BC, so a lot of these are historical or devotional works, is what they are. The pseudepigrapha, uh, uh, pseudo, kind of pretend, fake, pigrapha, epigrapha, writings. So they're often attributed to people like Solomon, and uh, even though Solomon didn't write it, right? But they're, he's given credit for it, so maybe people will read it if they think it's from Solomon. That's what the pseudepigrapha are. They're, they're between 200 BC and 200 AD, so it's kind of setting the limits for this uh, period of time. And then Dead Sea Scrolls. There's uh, different varieties of Dead Sea Scrolls. Some are biblical texts, right? So it's, they're copies or interpretations of biblical texts. Others are apocryphal works, right, attributed to somebody. The others are what they call sectarian works. So this is how the community operates. This is how we run. Some people think that maybe John the Baptist emerged out of the Dead Sea Scroll community. I'm not sure about that. But the main point I'm making that is this uh, literature that comes up between the Testaments is informative. It tells us how people were thinking, what they were expecting, what they were looking forward to. And it's going to help us bridge into the New Testament times where the question that we're going to be faced with in particularly uh, current scholarship is God has God replaced Israel. As he said, hey, you know, they were so bad, I've given up on them. Or as I said before, what the, how they'll phrase it, people who take that view, is they'll say something like that, uh, in the light of Jesus, the promises that God made to Israel have been radically reinterpreted. Right? That's, that's the way they'll try to present it, that some radical change has happened. What I'm, going to, what I'm showing you here is that, at least between the Testaments so far, people were expecting the literal fulfillment of these promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob the Abrahamic, the Davidic, the, the uh, land, and the new covenants. They were looking forward to literal, literal fulfillment of those. So again, popular expectations, the culture Jesus stepped into, helps us understand, you know, we want to take this literal, historic, grammatic, hermeneutic to the Bible, helps us understand what they were thinking, what they were expecting. So it uh, helps us understand what Jesus and his hearers just took for granted, just assumed. Helps us understand that. So here's an example of what one of these things look like. Here's the Psalms of Solomon. And let's see. He shall gather together a holy people whom he shall lead in righteousness. So he's talking about the coming Messiah. This is the looking forward to Jesus coming, or the Messiah coming. And he shall judge the tribes of the people that has been sanctified by the Lord his God. And he shall not suffer unrighteousness to lodge any more in their midst, nor shall there dwell with them any man that knows wickedness. For he shall know them, that they are all sons of God, and he shall divide them according to their tribes upon the land. And neither sojourner nor alien shall sojourn with them any more. He shall judge peoples and nations in the wisdom of his righteousness. So look what they're saying here. He's going to gather together a holy people. We've seen this over and over, right? We've seen this in the land covenant. We've seen this in the Davidic covenant. We've seen it in the new covenant. He's gathering his people. It's the same expectation that he has. Whoever's writing this, this intertestamental literature, that he is going to sanctify them. Echo with a new covenant here. That he is going to change them somehow, make them holy. They're going to all be sons of God and to be the tribes will be on the land. So here's my main focus right now as we're looking on the land. The expectation between the testaments is that Israel's looking forward to being restored to the land. 
They're expecting that to happen, just like Abraham said it was going to happen, just like the land covenant, just like the Davidic covenant. That this expectation continues, it hasn't died. And this is what Jesus is stepping into. Here's another one. Everyone that shall then be saved and shall be able to escape on account of his works or by his faith by which he has believed, shall such shall survive from the perils, he had talked about them before, and shall see my salvation in the land and within my borders, which I have sanctified for myself eternally. So again, here's this intertestamental literature, and salvation is going to be in the land. When he's talking about um, salvation here, Again, don't read the New Testament concept of the salvation of the church age back into the Old Testament or this intertestamental literature that's based on the Old Testament. He's talking about physically being saved, being snatched out of wherever they're at, wherever danger they are in. They're going to be saved and they're going to be in the land. That's what their expectation is. That's what they're looking forward to. That's what they're hoping for. They're going to be within these borders. What are these borders? These are the borders that were established in the Abrahamic covenant. That they're expecting this literal fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in between the testaments. They're not spiritualizing this, right? They're not saying that, oh, uh, land now just represents the blessings of knowing God. No, they're not doing that. They're expecting to see themselves restored to the land. They're looking forward to that in this intertestamental literature. Here's some of the, uh, here's Psalm 37. We're going to come back to this uh, in the next section. Uh, but uh, Psalm 37, but the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Remember what we said in Deuteronomy, how we uh, summarized the blessings that God had promised in two ways. What were they? Prosperity and security. Prosperity and security. That's what 3711 is talking about here. Prosperity and security in the land. In Qumran, so this, the one on the right is a, is a text from uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the poor shall possess the land and enjoy peace and plenty. It's interpreting Psalm 37 here. Its, in, its interpretation concerns the congregation of the poor. Keep this in mind when we get to the New Testament who will tough out the period of distress and will be rescued from the snares of Belial. Afterwards, all who shall possess the land will enjoy and grow fat with every, everything enjoyable to the flesh. Prosperity and security. Now keep in mind that whoever's writing these Qumran interpretive texts doesn't know about a coming tribulation at this point. He's just reading the Old Testament, making some deductions. He knows that there's going to be this period of uh, they're going to be that they need to be rescued from a period of distress, Jacob's trouble, right? A period of Belial, a term for Satan, an evil time. Doesn't doesn't know about a seven year uh, tribulation unless he's looking really closely at the end of Daniel and making some deductions. But that hasn't been revealed yet. So there's. But they're, but they're doing the same thing we do. They're, doing it, they're reading the Bible literally. They're reading it grammatically. They're reading it historically. And they have, the, have this expectation for a literal fulfillment of what God's promised. What God's promised. Just like we do. So they'll be rescued. They're going to possess the land. They're going to grow fat. Um, I'm not crazy. I'll quote somebody that smarter than me that backs me up on this. He's an expert in, uh, on this period and talks about Josephus and his expectations. And he says, Josephus, before we read this, keep in mind, Josephus was a uh, Jewish army officer, right? That's how he started out. And then uh, was captured and started serving Titus. So some would look at him as kind of a traitor, right? But he was trying to actually help Israel, trying to explain Israel to the Romans, right? You would think that Josephus would want to um, play down 
Israel's claims for land and a future kingdom in such an environment. But here's what she says, Josephus is not unpatriotic or anti-nationalistic in the sense of landlessness. In his writings, he retains land in his prophecies of the future, even to the possible displeasure of his Roman readers. Right, so even though it might cause him trouble, Josephus is trying to explain to the Romans what the Jews are expecting, and he is telling them they are expecting land and seed and blessing because he is reading the same Abrahamic land, Davidic, and New Covenants that you are reading. And he's expecting a literal fulfillment of those. Nothing he's read in the Old Testament Nothing he's seen dissuades him from this expectation of a future literal fulfillment. So it's not, um, she decides that either uh, neither earlier writer Philo nor the later writer Josephus ever abandoned their commitment to the land. So Josephus was actually trying to explain Judaism to a Greek philosophical audience. Right? He was trying to explain how this works to them. Got a little compromise in the process, but that's what he was trying to do. And again, neither explaining it to the Romans or explaining it to Greeks, they had any difference with regard to the land. Just like the other intertestamental writers, they were expecting literal fulfillment. There's nothing, nothing happens in between the testaments to make them think otherwise. They're all expecting this. So we see that people that were writing before, while, and after Jesus was on earth were looking for blessings in the land. Right? They were looking for blessings in the land where they would find safety under the worldwide reign of this righteous judge. The people Jesus spoke to when he came were reading not only the Hebrew scriptures, but they, were, they had this apocryphal literature with them as well. They knew about these things. And they also were expecting this literal fulfillment of the covenants and the prophets. They were looking forward to this. So they're fueling this literal fulfillment expectation. So the question comes up as we head into the New Testament is, does Jesus say anything that will cause them to change their mind. Is anything written in the New Testament that would say, oh, no, actually, uh, these promises are not going to be literally fulfilled. There's some sort of spiritual fulfillment. Is there anything at all? So as we go into the Gospels and the Epistles, we'll take a look at that. And we'll try to answer some of the critics. So let's